Before we begin, I'd like to say a few words, please. As many of you already know, Nina Library is the Europe Direct Information Centre, EDI for short, for Countess Tipperary, Limerick, Cork and Kerry. Uh, one of eight such centres nationwide and one of 500 plus spread throughout the United States of the European Union. In a nutshell, we stand as points of contact or information between the member citizens of the Member States of the European Union and the European Commission. This talk here tonight is one of a series of events on Nina Edicts Canada 2019. First of all, I start by thanking a few people. My thanks to Brendan Maher here at the source and to his staff, particularly Ursula and Louise, for facilitating this event. Uh, Tipperary County Council are always anxious and pleased to be able to cooperate with other organisations within the community. And so we were delighted to be able to bring this evening talk to the Source Arts Centre here, this wonderful centre here in Thurles. I would also like to thank my colleagues next of all, my colleagues next door in the library there, Jerry and Mary, and particularly John and James for all their practical and technical support tonight. This talk was born out of another similar talk that Professor Lucy gave in Nina Library on Brexit last June. Brexit, not as bad as you think, was engaging and informative and a very led to a very lively Q&A session afterwards, of which I hope we have something similar here tonight. But if I recall correctly, the bottom line of your talk last year, Brian, was Brexit, disaster, but a disaster still it is, was happening. There was no going back and there was no do-over. So we should stop wringing our hands and get on with it. And in fact, from this and from our point of view, start to see it and avail of the opportunities that it might afford us, particularly in terms of uh, enticing UK companies and financial centres to see Ireland as a European base. So, that was then, this is now, as we head towards D-Day, Kirk towards some of us would say, uh, D-Day on the 29th of March, where are we now? Before, we thought that that's this stage, it would be a very opportune time to bring Brian Lucy back and to bring him to a wider audience here in the United States of Education. Brian Lucy himself needs no intro introduction. He is, as you know, Professor of Finance at uh, Trinity College Dublin uh, School of Business. Uh, he's also a regular columnist with the examiner speaking on matters economic and financial. He has a, uh, an MA in uh, International trade, uh, trade, Finance and Economics, and a PhD in Finance. Uh, in a former life, he worked in the Department of, Edu uh, in the Department of Health, and he was also a economist at the Central Bank. So I think he was very well placed to speak to us on this subject here tonight. On that point, uh, before I hand you over to Brian, could I just remind you, if you wouldn't mind turning your phones to silent, this, uh, this talk tonight will be uh, filmed and hopefully we'll be able to upload it uh, in the coming days to YouTube. Um, and with that, I think I will have to make it down. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's kind of unusual for a Perryman to be in, uh, in Turles in, uh, in, in, in the month of March. We usually kind of find our way to uh, major national stadia towns later on in the summer, although perhaps not as much recently as one might desire. But uh, we're working on that. We have a plan. Not sure it's a great plan. It's better perhaps than a Brexit plan. Uh, it's, it's tremendously interesting because tonight, of course, they're voting on, on one of the many meaningless, sorry, meaningful votes that they're talking about. So I'll, I'll be keeping an eye on the, uh, on the phone to see what the story is. So what I want to do is, uh, I feel like an air traffic controller here with this. Well, what I want to do is I want to run through some of the issues around Brexit. I want to maybe, perhaps, declutter some of the, the acronyms, declutter some of the ideas, suggest that there are certainly problems that Ireland is going to face nationally and regionally, but maybe these problems at a national level are perhaps less than you might think. And whatever we might want to then do, in terms of working out how we would share the national cake, that's something that we can do. You know, we can decide to vote for a party or not. We can decide to, you know, get our uh, urban-rural divide or our rich-poor divide. They, they're things we can control, at least in principle. We can't really control Brexit. You know, it's something that's happening. It's an independent decision by the UK as a sovereign country, and you know, as 
uh, as that goes, there's nothing we can do other than, you know, stand by and give advice as, as, as a friendly neighbour. So, let's think a little bit about it. So, what, what exactly is Brexit? I mean, it's one of these horrible portmanteau words that we've all become used to. Uh, British exit from the European Union. This in itself is quite interesting because it's not a UK exit, which doesn't sound as nice, but it suggests that this is driven by, at the very least, the island of Great Britain, if not in fact by those who would self-identify as being British, aka English. And at one level, this is really a resurgence of English nationalism. You know, the Scottish nationalists, there's Northern Irish nationalists, there's small, you, Northern Irish Unionists, as Welsh Nationalists, it's surprising in some ways that we haven't seen until now a resurgence of English nationalism. But we're seeing that now in space. And, and this is what they expected, you know, they're going to get unicorns and fairy tales, and there was going to be people gambling through fields of wheat, that's an early version of Theresa May, and it was all going to be great, and sunny uplands, and it was all going to be wonderful. You know, it was going to be the easiest deal ever. They were going to get not only the easiest deal ever, but they were going to get a better deal outside the European Union than they would inside the European Union, which was something quite interesting if, if that was to be the case. You know, and, and it was buoyed up by a sense of English exceptionalism, that because they were the nation of Francis Drake and Queen Elizabeth and Oliver Cromwell and Isabel King and Brunel and, and all these wonderful people, that they could pretty much dictate what they wanted to do. There was an empire upon which the sun would never set, perhaps because they couldn't trust the English in the dark. But anyway, the reality is something different. The reality is that um, Brexit is much more akin to this kind of situation, people teetering on a cliff edge and kind of cutting themselves off. Uh, everybody else is trundling off and it's not going to be an easy path. But they're cutting themselves off on the edge of a, of, of a cliff and hoping that everything will be okay. The, um, you know, the, this is perhaps the best cartoon I've ever seen. You know, they've, they've sawed off their hand, the hand of friendship that's been outstanding to them for 40 years and are running off, now, oblivious to the fact that their stump is bleeding and they're losing blood and they're, you know, generally not going to be happy. I don't know if anybody here is a Terry Pratchett fan, but Terry Pratchett described the word a cheesing. And a cheesing is, as he described it, like a creaming, except it lasts for longer and it's harder. So the UK is undergoing a self-imposed cheesing through Brexit. There's going to be a lot of graphs in this. And these are the estimates of the effect, the hit to national income. Uh, compared to a benchmark. All of the figures I'll be talking about tonight are going to be compared to if nothing happened. So they're going to be losing between 7 and 5% and, and of their national income. Now there's one crew called Economists for Brexit. Literally nobody, even themselves, believes their figures. Um, it's, it's a complete outlier. The reality is that there's a group of experts who are all coalescing around a similar kind of approach you know, 3 to 5 percent, 7 percent maybe, that's probably the case. So the UK is going to lose a chunk of money. I mean, this is a big country. It's a really big country, 1.2 trillion euros uh, a year GDP. Lose 7 percent of that on an ongoing basis, and poof, that's going to hurt. And this is entirely self-imposed. We mustn't forget, and we mustn't, in a sense, when I say forgive, I mean, we mustn't let people off the hook. Nobody is making the UK do this but themselves. They voted in a referendum. They voted narrowly, but they voted to do this. Irregardless of the effects that they were told, in complete denial of the effect it would have on their other European partners, not least the only country with which it shares a land border, that, that would be us, and perhaps at a stretch, Gibraltar completely ignoring the realities of an interlinked global economy, they chose to do this. Fine. As Abraham Lincoln said, the people have the right to turn their back upon the fire, to turn their backside upon the fire. But then they should have to learn to sit upon the blisters. That's the problem. It's really easy to win an election by selling lies and palatable half-truths to people. Hell, you know, we know that in this country. You know, nobody ever wins an election by going, your life is going to be more miserable, 
and I'm going to make you work hard. Uh, okay, I'm going to go vote for her. But the reality is the reality. So, when you look then at you know, Northern Ireland would be literally off the scale. The curious thing is that the areas that voted most heavily for Brexit are the ones that are also going to be amongst the most heavily impacted. Just this evening, Nissan have announced that they're to cease production of the Infinity range of cars in Weirside, in their, in, in, in their, in their Weirside plant. And this is the slow death of the British car manufacturing industry, which is not huge anymore, but it's totemic because, you know, it was one of the world's leading car manufacturers for years, and this is bleeding out in front of them. So, day after day, you see a constant drip feed of companies announcing their leaving, of companies announcing their ceasing investment, of a reduction of consumer confidence. They've done this to themselves. And the areas that are going to be most hit are, apart from Northern Ireland and Scotland, the ones that vote most heavily for it. So it's a strange thing. We might want to then ask ourselves, you know, if this is so so bad, you know, what did they um, what, what what did they do? This is how most people I think would, would see Brexit. I hope this comes through. No. It's not coming through. I don't think we can see that. Can you hear that? The sound worked earlier on today. Somebody had a lot of time in their hands. Take back control of our borders. 
except for the one that actually is of order because we don't want to take control of that. Yeah, 74% of Leave voters said this is the main reason they voted for it. Take back control of all of our borders, above offer excludes terms and conditions and cutting out. Many people here will remember, I certainly do, being stuck in tailbacks on both sides of the border, north and south. And, uh, you know, that's, that's not that long ago, it's 20, 25 years ago. They were lied to, there's going to be 72 million Turks going to come into the European Union. Well, no. Turkey has been trying to get into the European Union since Adam's dog was a pup, and it's never going to happen. Its political structures are incompatible with the European Union, the more so now since they have a soft coup with Erdogan. And there's no possible way that that's ever going to happen. So that was a lie, and known to be a lie. Uh, this is the kind of phraseology, the, the cost of EU immigration to Britain's welfare system. Of course, the sad reality is that if you look for both the UK and Ireland, new Europeans, as let's call them, or new Irish, new British people from Poland and Latvia and Romania, tend, in fact, to have higher qualifications, earn more, and cost the state less than us. So rather than being a net drain on the UK welfare system, they're a net contributor. But it's this idea that they're queue jumping citizens of nowhere that Theresa May has been putting forward. That resonates with, with, with a large number of people. <clears throat> number of refugees coming to Britain to claim asylum, you know, let's be blunt, you know, brown Muslims coming to our shores, despite the fact that, you know, they were coming to Germany and Austria and going, yeah, well, this is fine. Germany's 80 million people, they took in 1 million refugees, and three years after that, 80% of them would describe themselves as fully assimilated into Germany. Okay? So, a bunch of lies, a bunch of half-truths, very few people thinking about what was going on. So what happens now? What happens now? Where is the UK going to go? Where, where's, it, where's it going to take us? Well, this has been going around for quite some time. What are the options it has? It could go for the kind of European uh, economic area, Norway and Iceland, which are in effect in the European Union, except that they don't get, they get to pay in, they get to accept all of the rules, and they're politely listened to, but they don't have a vote of the council. The Norwegian finance minister doesn't have a say in European economic policy. The Icelandic justice minister doesn't have a say about European security policy. They're, they're listened to politely, and their views are taken on board, they haven't got a vote. Or we could be like Switzerland, which has even less, or they could be perhaps like Turkey, have a, a free trade agreement. The reality is, today, we're here, at a no deal, out into what's called the World Trade Organization, which is the basic architecture of world trade in the absence of anything else. Now, there's a reason that large numbers of countries are busy trying to get themselves into trade agreements. You've got NAFTA, North American Free Trade Association, you've got the Trans-Pacific Partnership, You've got the EU-Japan free trade agreement. Countries like to have arrangements so that they can trade on favourable terms with each other. And the UK is throwing that out the window. The landscape is complex. The European Union is not a homogenous group. There's lots and lots of bits and pieces and semi-detached areas. And you know, we think of the Euro, we think of the European Union, but countries like Montenegro use the European Union, they use the Euro. You know, the, Turkey is in effect in the European Customs Union, but not in the European Union. You've got countries uh, like Belarus, Kazakhstan and Russia, which share some relationships through the Council of Europe. Of course you've got the inner core, the Euro area, and you've got Schengen. So there's a whole pile, of, whole pile of bits and pieces which all kind of more or less move along happily. And, and the UK is proposing to scrap in its entirety, all of those, and to really be you know, out there or, or there or somewhere, in an entirely unknown territory. This is not, of course, impossible, but the idea that it can be done seamlessly or without cost is, I would argue, somewhat doubtful. We hear a lot of acronyms, customs unions, free trade arrangements, and European economic area. 
And if we think of a kind of a set of Venn diagrams, you've got three core pillars to the European Union as we know it now. The freedom of movement of people to work. This is often forgotten. It's not freedom of movement. You can't just simply schlep up and decide you want to live in rural, rural Poland. You can, but the Poles will ask, well, can you support yourself? Ireland and the UK are less stringent about asking people, can you support yourself? Do you have a job? Can you support yourself with savings? There's going to be restrictions, perhaps, on the amount of social welfare you can earn, etc. These are all entirely within the remit of any country to put in place. It's freedom of movement to work. It's not freedom of movement to go and draw the door. So if the UK or Ireland have a problem with people allegedly coming, and the oh, they come and they get off the boat and they get 14 free houses the following day, well, A, that's a lie, and B, if it was true, it's entirely our fault. The free movement of capital, in other words, that you can trade financial services and money can flow from any country to any country, and the free movement of goods. And these all require certain things to happen. They all require certain things, such as the freedom of establishment and the recognition of, 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 of licenses, so that you know, a Hungarian dentist can, with very limited uh, regulatory burden, come and set up in, in Thurlis if she wishes. That an Irish architect can go and he can start working in Milan with, with very little in the way of a problem, because it's recognised that the qualifications are, are, are the same, or at least they're of a similar level. And again, in pulling out of Europe, in the way in which the UK is pulling out, all of this will go. UK architects will no longer be able to work anywhere without proving, basically, that they can do the job. It's not because the European Union wants to be mean, it's simply because the UK has decided to put itself into a different path. Its position is very similar to this. We all remember blazing saddles. And the sheriff had the wonderful trick, you know, basically, you know, give me what I want or I'm going to shoot myself. And that's pretty much what the UK is threatening to do. And unless the European Union breaks its own red lines, unless the European Union, in effect, acts illegally, because remember, the European Union is not a club. It's not like, you know, going down to the swimming pool or playing a hand of 45. It's a set of legal, binding international treaties. And we know more than anybody else, because we have to vote on the plastic things every time they come up. And we've been known to say, hold on, we don't like this. And then the government goes off and tries to get another negotiated settlement. So for example, Nice, we voted no, for a variety of reasons. The government went off, it got a whole set of arrangements, which were put into a legally binding text. And if anybody's interested in what those were, they are an appendix to the Treaty of Accession of Croatia, which is a legally binding text. Oh yes, also, Croatia joins the European Union, P.S. Ireland, following things don't apply. Fine, we voted again. It's a legally binding arrangement, it's not a club. And you cannot overturn legally binding arrangements on a whim. Jean -Paul Juncker, uh, Michel Barnier, Jean Paul Juncker cannot simply go, ah, look, sure, three said, you know, we like you, you know, it doesn't matter, ignore that. It doesn't work like that. Countries don't work like that. International law doesn't work like that. So, what are the options? I'm, going to, I'm sure these slides will be made available afterwards if people really want them. But this is effectively a, a kind of a, an expanded version of the slide beforehand. The UK is really, right now it's got all of these things. But what it doesn't have is the ability to negotiate its own trade deals with the rest of the world. Very interestingly, one of the big things that people in the UK are saying about Brexit is, well, you know, we can go back to the way it was in 1972 and we can work with the Commonwealth. And yet, um, Rudd, the ex-Australian um, Prime Minister, had a scathing article yesterday in the, in the UK papers going, this is deluded. This is 46 years ago. Things have moved on. We're not there anymore to supply you with cheap beef. We're busy trading with the rest of the world. You know, cop yourself on. But it's this sense of having lost control, 
this sense of willing, wanting to take back control, this sense of being desirous of having its ability to negotiate its own trade deals, which it is dubious because smaller countries don't get good deals. The UK is just one country. This is sometimes what's called Brino, Brexit in name only. And in effect, we are now at a point of inflection between these two situations. And as is highly likely, let me just check, if they vote down their... Um, yeah, it's is it gone, is it? Yeah, so they voted down May's agreement today. Now that means that tomorrow they have to vote on whether or not they take no deal, a crash out off the table. One assumes they would do that. But if they don't, then by automatic action of UK law, they crash out on the 29th of, May, of, of March into this World Trade Organization where everything becomes really, really difficult for everybody. And that's the apocalyptic scenario that, in a sense, I think we should look at. Because if you're prepared for the worst and hope for the best, then you shouldn't be too badly put off. It, one of the more maddening things dealing with people involved in this is, it's not just in the UK, this idea that in some way Ireland is so intimately attached to the UK economically that we are just a mere periphery, a, a dingleberry to, to the UK, that we have no independent economic existence beyond the UK. Well, let's have a little think about that. Ireland's UK share of Ireland's trade in goods and services. Right now, 2016, 2017 figures are down around here. We exported last year, 11% of our exports went to the UK. 11%. We import a bit more, we're a bit more dependent on the UK for imports, but 18%. So 9 in 10 euros of every euro of uh, every 10 euros that go out of Ireland as an export, go to somewhere other than the UK. Now, you know, this is very different to the 1970s. But look, 1972, joint European Union. 1992 is when this really begins to fall off a cliff. Why? Because that's the introduction of the single market. The ability of Irish companies to seamlessly export whatever they could and to import from wherever they wish, anywhere in the European Union without any barrier. In fact, you could turn the argument on and say that they need us more than we need them because we're one of the very few countries with whom the UK has a positive trade balance. Countries are not households, but countries do have to, at a macroeconomic level, balance their books. If you import more than you export, you have to make up that loss in some way. The UK does it very simply. The UK imports an awful lot more goods than it exports. But it exports an awful lot more services than it imports. Because, particularly in London, you've got these century-old companies and, and pools of expertise on some of the most arcane aspects of, of law. You've got some of the world's leading um, accounting companies. You've got incredibly good companies around PR and communications. It's a, it's a services powerhouse. But we're one of the few countries where they actually have a positive relationship. And if you look at it, we actually have, we, we, we sell quite a lot of pharmaceuticals, we sell a lot of agri food, I've got to come back to this, particularly given where I am. We import a lot of stuff, but we export quite a bit to the UK as well. But remember, all those are dwarfed by an order of magnitude of the stuff we export elsewhere. I'm not going to go through, through this. Uh, you, can, you can look at the slides if you want to. It just shows where the, um, you know, where the balance has come from. This masks some sectoral weaknesses. And if you look at exports and imports, exports being in blue, <coughs> imports being in, 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 in brown, we see that in agri-food, about half of the uh, imports of agri-food come from the UK. Only about 20% of, of our exports, even of agri-food, go to the UK. 
Now obviously in some product lines that's much more, but in some product lines it's much less. Wholesale retail is more balanced, pharmaceuticals, etc. In other words, there are large chunks of the Irish economy which, while the UK is of course being a large and close neighbour with whom we share many, many cultural similarities, of course it's going to be our big market. It's not our biggest market, it's not our only market. I wonder if the 29th of March should become perhaps, given all of that, a you know, national holiday in the UK, and it could be National Wrong Way Corrigan Day. Does anybody here know who Wrong Way Corrigan was? Anybody? Well, Wrong Way Corrigan was a man who set out, as he said, to fly from New York to Los Angeles and ended up flying from New York to Clifton. Uh, and he became known as Wrong Way Corrigan. And he was one of the, at the time, he was one of the fastest people to fly solo across the, uh, uh, across the Atlantic. But I wonder if, we should, if the UK should institute National Wrong Way Corrigan Day because they're going about it the wrong way. They're talking about a free trade agreement. Free trade agreements tend to cover goods. We have a free trade agreement with Japan. You can pretty much know export anything you want to, import anything you want to from Japan with very little in the way of customs or regulatory control. You can't do that with services. It's more difficult. Remember, the UK has a chronic deficit in goods. It is enormously, enormously indebted, as it were. You know, it imports more than exports from Germany to the tune of about 30 billion a year. There's only a few countries, Sweden, Ireland, Denmark, to whom it exports more than it imports. And it makes up that balance by being a chronic services exporter. Look, Germany, you know, they get back another four and a half, five billion of the 30 billion that they, you know, had in, had, had in deficit. So the UK balances its books by being a services powerhouse and by having a reserve currency which allows it to effectively gain financial flows to keep itself afloat. So it's like a company that sells two sets of goods. And one is a loss leader, the other is a real profit maker. And how does it, how does it balance? It, it balances itself by trying to balance these two out. That's services and goods. And if necessary, using trade credit or short-term bank loans to keep the wood from the door. And that's what a, a, a reserve currency does for the UK. But they're focusing entirely on the goods. They're focusing on cars, they're focusing on cheese, they're focusing on stuff. The UK is really bad at making stuff. I mean, who here would willingly buy a Vauxhall? Please, don't, you know. Given a choice, would you, would you rather buy a Vauxhall or a Volkswagen? I just bought a Volkswagen T1 and I love it. I mean, this is the reality. You know what I mean? Stuff ain't that good. Services, fantastic. You want to get the best lawyer in the world on something or other, you're probably going to go and look at the UK. They're good at that. They're not good at making stuff. And they're focusing on it the wrong way, wrong way cargo. So what happens if there's this hard Brexit? Well, I'd argue that, it, in fact, this is from the Department of Finance, it's much more likely to be a headwind than a hurricane. This is compared, again, to nothing happening. So the baseline figure is, this is a 2016 figures, they, they, they tend to move up and down a little bit, but the ranking stays the same. In other words, if the UK stays in the European Union and nothing happens, in 20 years, we would be 40% richer than we are now. If the UK leaves, crashes out, World Trade Organization, you know, biblical plague and famine, you know, cats and dogs marrying each other, dead walk in the streets, we'd be 30% larger than we were. Okay, we're not going to be smaller. We're still be 30% bigger than we were, as opposed to 40%. Okay, doesn't sound too bad. It's a headwind. We'd rather be 40%, but 30% will do. So that's the reality of a hard Brexit for Ireland, economically. And if we look at how that comes about, 
After 10 years, remember, this is not in one year. This, it might be front-loaded, but after 10 years, gross value added a measure of national income would be about 2.5% smaller. Exports would be about 3% less. The average wage would be about 2% less than what it would have been had the UK stayed in, not in absolute terms. These will still be big, high rise numbers, but they'll be less than they would have been otherwise. So, when we look at even a crash out scenario, any Brexit, a soft Brexit, will lead to a, 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 a reduction of exports, a hard Brexit will lead to a reduction of exports. A soft Brexit will lead to a reduction of national income. A hard Brexit will lead to a reduction of national income. There is no good that can come of Brexit for Ireland. It's just a matter of how bad it's going to be. We can skip that. Why do I want to skip that? Come on. Come on. This is how the country's national income is made up. This down here is the percentage added by agriculture. It's all the same. All the talk about the beef industry collapsing, all the talk about Ireland will, you know, because they sell cheese, the UK will want to collapse. All this stuff. Well, I don't know. I mean, if you look at, say, distribution, which is, you know, sales, infinitely bigger, but the industry, enormous. You look even at, you know, real estate, finance, ICT, this is not an agricultural country. Ireland might be an agricultural town, but it ain't an agricultural country. And before anybody goes on and starts thinking, what the heck does your man know from the Trinity College Dublin? You know, I was born and brought up in the bog in Kerry. I live on the edge of a bog, I'm a little bear. You know, I'm quite happy to be self described as a culture. I'm not a fan of metropolitan elitism, says the professor at Trinity College. But, you know, that's the reality. A third of the population live in cities, two thirds don't. So, you know, we have to be realistic. We are not an agricultural country. We aren't. That's gone. That was 1972. This is 19. This is 19. It's 2019. I'm still catching up with the millennium. The problem we have is that the agribusiness tends to be disproportionately higher in employment terms. And that's the kicker. Agriculture is, for the most part, a relatively labour intensive activity. Not just primary agriculture, but processing, manufacturing. It's, it requires people more than other stuff does. So even though it might only be about 5% or 3% of the economy, it's making up about 10% of, of total employment. And that's, that's where the problem lies. Not so much that every business, and I'm using that as a very loose generic term, is, is going to lose income. It's that it's going to lose proportionately more workers. And, you know, that's not good. If 100 people lose their jobs in Thurlis, that's a kick in the pants for a small to medium sized town. If 100 people lose their jobs in Cork because a medium sized chemical company downsizes, it's a tragedy for 100 people, but it just rolls on. So that's the problem we face, not the fact that agriculture is the driving engine of the Irish economy anymore. So, um, let me do another head count on this. Why, why are we in the mess we're in? This is quite stark and this is quite shocking. I mean, every single election in Northern Ireland tends to devolve into a sectarian head count. That's the sad reality. You know, you can see where the Brexit votes are. Is it because farmers and fishermen of a unionist persuasion think that it's a good idea? No. It's that they don't see any other option because it's vote for our pro or vote for their pro. You remember Northern Ireland has been without a government for two and a half years. Both parties quite happy 
it seems to me, to have Stormont in abeyance because they could point the finger at the others. But the result is Northern Ireland has had no voice at the table, even if it was a voice that would be ignored, you know. And all of this angst about whether the UK goes out into a hard or soft or half-baked or cuddled brings it is about the backstop, this backstop as it's called. So what is the backstop? Well, the backstop is very simple. Right now we've got no checks. There is no difference between north and south. The border is invisible. You know, you barely notice it's there. You notice it's there because you see the road signs change. You know, at two or three kilometres either side of it. Goods and services shuttle back and forth with absolutely no barrier whatsoever. As just as much as they do between Northern Ireland and the UK or between the UK and Spain. The, um, the argument for the backstop is effectively that if you wish to, under the Good Friday Agreement, preserve the free flowing border, then you've got a problem because the UK will be outside of the European Union. How do you stop goods and services going from one customs union, the UK, into the other customs union, the European Union, or vice versa? Let's say you get divergence of, of, of standards. How can anybody be confident about the origin of the stuff if you can simply shuttle it back and forth between the North and, and Scotland or the UK and then simply drive it into the European Union or vice versa? And the answer is you can't. It's not possible. There are no magic technological you know, drones manned by unicorns using blockchain technology that can, that can police the border. For the love of God, 50,000 British soldiers, 25,000 RUC, 10,000 full-time RUC reserve, 7,500 members of the Royal Irish Regiment, 12,000 Irish police and soldiers, and he couldn't, couldn't see the border. You know, this is, unless you literally want to put a concrete Trump-like barrier up, and, and even then you're going to be cutting across people's houses, literally, you can't see it. So it's a big problem. And the proposal is that there has to be some checks. There have to be checks either between on the border, back to the pre-1972 customs border, and as sure as eggs are eggs, you put a customs post up, somebody's going to take a pop shot at it, they're going to throw a stone, they're going to drive a car into it, and it isn't going to be some mad Republican, it's going to be somebody driven to their wits end by the fact that they want to get down the road to get their eggs. And then once that happens, the whole cycle starts off again. We often think Constable Billy Arco was the first victim of the, of, of the Troubles in the North in 1966. It wasn't actually. The first shots were fired prior to that at Customs Post in Belkou. That's the danger. And that's the, to say oh, you're giving it to terrorists is maybe true, but it's also as facile as saying you don't need, you don't need to deal with anything. If we don't if, let's say, the UK crashes out, and if it refuses to put up a border, we are going to have to put up a hard border. Because if we don't, then there's going to be a hard border put up against us at every European port. And whatever the disruption a hard Brexit will cause, being semi-detached from the single market will drive us back to a pre-1992 pre situation. Does anybody here for a minute think that Intel, which has put nine billion on the table to expand its chip factory in Leeds, do we really think it's going to continue to do that if it thinks it might have to actually get customs ships? They just go off to Israel, which has got a free trade agreement with the European Union. So we have to face up to some of our realities as well. Of course, the government doesn't want to say to put up hard water. That would be giving away leverage. But we all in our hearts know. If we don't do it, it'll be done unto us. And whatever we might think about the fourth green field, whatever the inconvenience might be of driving up north to see our relatives or go to a match, whatever the inconvenience might be for people living on the border, that's a price the Irish government would happily pay against the certainty of hundreds of thousands of job losses in every town and village in this country. It would be utterly irresponsible for any government not to do that. Of course, the 
problem is you've got a backstop. You know, Sammy, God bless Sammy, where would we be without him? Probably better off. And, you know, when you have language like this coming out of what is supposed to be a respectable politician, this devilish Euromaniac is doing his best to keep the United Kingdom balanced by the chains of bureaucracy and control. Arrogant, stiffening resistance, trident wielding cabal. I mean, you know, crank it way the hell back down, Sally. This kind of inflammatory, frankly demented rhetoric does no good to anybody in any negotiation. It makes the DUP, if this were possible, look even more foolish than they are. But this is one of this is one of the intellectual powerhouses behind Brexit. Just ponder on that for a moment. I mean, this presumably was the reaction when they saw that comment from him, you know, like, come on, mate. You know, you probably don't drink being a good Presbyterian boy, but if you are, you really need to, you know, just get out of the Bushmills and Silvery for a moment. And the great thing, by the way, is if they go for hard drugs, the Bushmills can't sell itself as Irish whiskey. Irish whiskey is a geographically controlled entity. They can't sell it. And, you know, this is one of the crown jewels of, of global cuisine. And they're willing to trash it. I love this picture of Churchill. Um, complex man. But this is one of his famous, uh, famous phrases after World War I. And in many ways, it's actually quite apt. You know, the whole map of Europe is being redrawn. You know, great empires have not risen and fallen, but you know, the European Union, as we know it, has changed. At the dead beasts of stride, the walks speak short, we see the dreary steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone emerging once again. And this is the exacerbated tone that most senior British politicians deal with when they contemplate Northern Ireland. They go, oh, sweet God, what do we do now? So, you know, Belfast Telegraph, not known for its sympathies towards a uh, nationalist cause, did a very interesting poll in December, and it suggested that there was going to be a lot of issues. You know, 50% of people, 60% of people, thought that Brexit was going to make a United Ireland more likely. And whether it will or not, it certainly has thrown the cat amongst the pigeons. Back in 2016, when Farage and Gojo and Jacob Rees Mogg and all these other revenants from the past, Jacob Rees Mogg, the uh, par parliamentary representative of the 17th century, was um, they were saying, oh, the European Union is going to break up. I mean, the Euro is going to be breaking up in two years for the last 20 years. And yet you ask anybody who says that, and you say, well, the kind of euros while you're waiting for it to break up, and, and they won't give it to you. So let's look at this growing wave of exit. Poland will leave. Germany will leave. They'll all leave. Everybody's leaving. Uh, no, not so much the leaving. No, thank you. In fact, in Ireland, <laughs> the last year of Rupture figure was 90% of people would vote to stay in the European Union. In certain cohorts, urban people between the age of 18 and 25, it was 99% of people would vote to stay in the European Union. Now, polls, yeah, you can say what you like about polls. That order of magnitude, it's a long way from there to 50%. What does Europe think? So this is the percentage of income in each region that's exposed to Brexit. Germany, yeah, will be hit. Ireland, to some extent, will be hit. You know, places have a sheriff time. Going to be hit. The UK is the one that's going to be taking the biggest hit from Brexit. You know, not anybody else. As far as the Swedes are concerned, like Brexit, that's still a thing. You know, Spain, yeah. You know, Greece, yeah, right, whatever. Europe, frankly, doesn't care. We care because we're stuck next to it. You know, our neighbour is busy, you know, burning down his house. And we're frantically trying to, you know, throw some water and take a fire extinguisher so that our place doesn't burn down. People three doors down the road are looking, going, ooh, well, he seems such a nice man, so quiet. <coughs> this is a 
very recent publication, uh, The Effects of Brexit in EU27. Well, you know, some people thought the UK would be better off, much less thought the European Union would be better off, but vastly more thought that the UK would be worse off. So the European Union is looking in on this, you know, S show and going, okay, if you really want to do that, that's fine. But we don't think it's going to be of any great importance to most of us. So back in 2016, we had this, you know, I keep saying Derek Davis. I remember the, uh, the newscaster, David Davis. He, uh, he said, oh, you know, the, the, the day after we vote for Brexit, there will be a stream of people calling up from German industry to Angela Merkel, demanding that they sign a free trade deal with the UK. Uh, no, didn't happen. Now, Bojo uh, famously said, well, you know, Italian prosecco makers and French cheese makers will, will demand access to the UK market. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe not. So what's going on? So tonight, this fell. It lost. So tomorrow, we have another meaningless vote, or meaningful vote. And that's on whether or not they want to take off the table the idea of no deal. A crash out into this hard Brexit, apocalyptic scenario. It is probable. It is probable that they will reject the idea of a no deal. I mean, it, if they went for this, it would be an act of collected insanity by Parliament. I wouldn't rule it out. They've shown themselves to be willing to vote for strange things. They, they, they keep trying to vote for that which is not on offer. They still, two and a half years into this process, have not decided what they want. You know, what they want, they can't get. What they get, what they can get, they don't want. There's an irreducible gap there. But even if they decide to reject the idea of crashing out, then on Thursday, they have to vote and decide if they want to ask the European Union for an extension on Article 50. What is all that? Article 50 is the process by which they are withdrawn from the European Union. It is in UK law, and they fall out on the 29th of March. So they will have to ask two weeks beforehand if they can extend that. There is absolutely no guarantee whatsoever that the European Union will do anything other than reach back to what Oliver Cromwell said. You have sat too long for any good you have been doing. Depart, I say. Let us have done with you. In the name of God, go. You know, I mean, whatever you can say about Cromwell, you know, he coined a few good phrases. And this is pretty much how Europe sees. <coughs> The European Union, the European Union sees, uh, sees the UK. Let's say they get an extension of two months. Remember, there's European parliamentary elections coming up. The European Parliament has to approve any withdrawal agreement and any future trading arrangement. So you can't have your UK MEPs sitting in a parliament when they'll have to leave it two weeks later. It just doesn't make any sense. So you give them a two month extension, but what then? I mean, what are they going to find? in two months that they haven't found in two and a half years. This is the problem they have. So where next? I mentioned at the start that we had this English nationalism and English exceptionalism and this sense that they were entitled to different treatment because of their very specialness. That they were special snowflakes and that everybody would bow to what they wished, and it must come as a terrible good shock when, you know, Johnny Foreigner just simply doesn't. The problem is that you've got this Janus face in the UK. You know, you have the ugly face of nationalism, which of course you do in every nationalistic environment, and you have the pragmatic person who wants to go and do business, but they're embodied in the same set of arguments at the same time. This is set against the background of, you know, a, a new world order. You know, Donny and, and, and Vlad, you know, best of buddies. 
I mean, who would think 15 or 10 years ago that the person standing up most strongly for the global capitalistic trading order was the president of China? You know, what, what parallel dimension are we in? <coughs> Do, do we think about, you know, some sort of back to the future? Is this where we're going? You know, except without a DeLorean. You know, I remember this. You know, customs borders. This is what we are going to face in this island. This is what the UK is facing, vis-a-vis -vis everybody else, if it chooses to crash out on the 29th of March. And even then, let's assume that somehow or other a miracle happens and the UK agrees some sort of orderly withdrawal. Some other fudge happens, an agreement is made. Then the real hard work starts because then they have to sit down and negotiate a future comprehensive trading arrangement with the European Union. And every single thing that has been discussed up to now will be discussed there. You want free access for your goods and services to our market? Absolutely no problem. We want free access of our people to work in the UK. Oh, that's a red line. Oh, well, you know, good luck selling your stuff to Venezuela. All of these will come back on the table. And the UK is no further down the line deciding what it wants. Shanae.
I mean, I'm not anti English, I have plenty of family friends and relatives there, but you know, we have to remember this is not our fault. Brian, is it, is it possible that this is slightly politically now, but this talk about the point you made about the TUP? Yeah. I mean, I've actually believed for a long, a long, quite a long time that the D, it's all about, it, it's a political system, but they did never sign up yeah. to the yeah. TUP. That. That's right, yeah. So, are they prepared to do this in yes. order to cause the downfall of the Belfast Agreement? Yes. To go back to your school? I'm, is that possible? I'm 100 percent convinced that as far as they're concerned, a hard border is absolutely a good thing. Because it allows them to differentiate themselves further from Dunn's, and it shows the inability of Northern Ireland to work as a political entity, therefore, you have to go back to some sort of direct rule, and it cements the you know, small t tribal nature that, that Northern Ireland politics is prone to. So, I'm not sure it goes so Machiavelli as to say it's a deliberate plan, but I think it would be an outcome they wouldn't really mind. You know, I think an awful lot of them would rather, you know, be slightly subservient to princes in hell than reign in heaven. Don't forget that the backstop would allow Northern Ireland, effectively, the, the initial backstop in 2017, would have given them an incredibly good position. They would have been part of both the UK and the European Union, Customs Union, and, and free trade areas. It would have been the place to go in the European Union to set up anything, because you have free access to both policies. It would have been a nightmare for the idea. You know, they'd be dead nice with a hard border. I mean, guess what? Don't forget, the North is poor. It's cheap. It's much easier to set up stuff there. You don't have to pay people as much. Houses are cheaper. Social services are propped up to the tune of about 30% of GDP by the UK. So it'd be a great place to set up business. The price would have been having checks on goods and services from Northern Ireland into the rest of the UK. Now, politically, I can see how that's a problem for the UK. I mean, it is a customs barrier within the country, and, and you know, we have to recognise that. So that's why they decided to have the entire UK in the backstop. But the price of the backstop is there has to be a way of ensuring that should the rest of the UK drop out, Northern Ireland doesn't. And who's going to decide on that? And that's what this is all about. So last night you had the farcical situation where the Attorney General of the United Kingdom, his office, goes and drafts an agreement that they think is legally watertight. The Prime Minister goes over to the, to, to, to the European Union, presents the Office of the Attorney General's analysis, and this morning the Attorney General calls it, quote, box. I mean, come on. We sometimes look at our TDs and, and quite rightfully go like, there are not enough pounds, not enough faces. But you just simply wouldn't see that. You know, we can critique, we can critique Irish politics for a lot, but they have been remarkably level-headed across all parties, remarkably calm, coherent, and mature. But yeah, I think you made the point. Yes, sir. But why then has the Irish government to say, given the, the, the nature of what's going on in Europe at the moment, and say you have to vote two years ago, why haven't they actually set up a state shipping company? Instead of I don't need to bring the, 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 shipping, the shipping companies have already been doing it. But we'd say, are they not, we'd say increasing the, the, the transport links to... Transport yeah. links, the land bridge. Uh, latest analysis from the Economic and Social Research Institute are that of the rest of the world, forget what stuff that, we go, that goes to the UK to sell into the UK, okay? So you've got stuff to be produced in Ireland, for Ireland, got stuff to be produced in Ireland for Great Britain, and you've got stuff we produce in Ireland for elsewhere. Of the stuff that we produce for elsewhere, by volume, 50% of it goes via the UK. By volume. What do you ship by road? You don't ship high value stuff, you don't ship time sensitive stuff. That will go either by sea or will go by air. So by value, we're probably shipping about 20% of the rest of the world exports through the language. Yes, that's the point, is that But that's only 20%. In other words, 80% of our rest of the world exports don't rely on the language. And our rest of the world exports are about 70% of our exports. So, it's a problem, but it's not as big a problem as people think. It's a huge problem if you're somebody who's facing the pointy end and saying, how do I get my stuff from Turles 
to stretch in. That's a problem, and the problem is that you're going to be possibly hung up in a customs queue in Calais or in Dover. Nothing whatsoever we can do about that. Shipping companies have been expanding. The second largest shipping company in Europe is Arctic Shipping. Shipping companies have been expanding. The two largest shorts, short, short route roll on roll off ferries are operating out of Ireland. You know, if you're a shipping company, do you spend 150 million on the chance that there might be a Brexit? That would be hard? Or do you say, surely they're not going to be so stupid? as to have a situation whereby they're going to be facing tailbacks up to Carlisle on, on, from Dover. But the reality is they seem to be heading that way, and that's the difficulty. So how does a company, when does a company make an investment decision? I mean, you know, I would hate to be in that situation. But I'm in that situation to a certain extent because I'm chairman of a conference. The conference is supposed to take place in uh, Glasgow in June. If there's complete calamity, we have to put it. But at some stage, we have to make that call, and we've been holding out. And every time we think we've got a decision, something else happens. So until we know, we won't know. And if that's for a small conference, imagine what it's like if you're a shipping company. How do you make that huge investment? And in the meantime, you know, somebody in Korea has bought the ferry you might be wanting to buy. So it's a, it's a problem. That's, that's the point you're making about it. why is the state actually buying these ships and why is it speaking to the EU given the relationship they must because it doesn't the, 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 the nature of... The argument is it doesn't need to because there's a high probability that there won't be a problem and if there's a problem the belief is there's enough capacity after a couple of weeks of disruption to overcome it. No, whether that's true or not we'll, we'll see. Don't worry, Shane Ross is in charge. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you're chewing a little there. But I mean, look, that is the reality. It's like, it might not happen. If it does, it might be as bad. And if it is, who knows? Yes, sir. If, given the dark leadership in the UK, would the Irish government's negotiating position not have been improved if they started sending up architects to build for from day one? And took that view on this, yeah. and it was more likely to get them into the most safe position. Like In which case, the UK would have simply said, that's grand, don't have to worry about it, and they wouldn't negotiate it. Not necessarily very good at negotiating the Arctic, No. <laughs> the Irish border for all, 17.6 trillion euro. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, is there a possibility that, the um, first of all, is there a possibility or probability that bubble will burst? Which bubble? The, 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 the voters' delusions, when they, kind of, when they turn on the Tories, would the, oh. the GUP end up as a fall like? 30% of the people of Northern Ireland vote for the DUP regardless. Why? Because the alternative is to vote for either the Lundies of the Ulster Unionists or. What? Well, well, I mean, that's been an option for 50 years and, you know, it never took. I know, but would this be an option of an earthquake? I don't think so. I, I mean, I genuinely don't think so. I mean, I know plenty of people, you know, across diverse and different aspects, and there's a deep, bone deep tribal loyalty in, in, in a hard core of 30% nationalists, 30% unionists who will always vote Sinn Féin, always vote DUP, regardless. And in the UK's first past the post parliamentary system, that gives them both strong enclaves where they'll always have five or seven MEPs or MPs. Now, should they be the fall guy? Absolutely. They should be not only the fall guy, they should be kicked from here to eternity. Uh, but you have to ask, what sort of government gets itself into the situation where in a parliament of 650 million, uh, 650 people, they end up not just depending on, but being driven to the extremes by 10 people from one region who represent a small proportion of the voters in that one region. It's, it would be just as mad if it was Plaid Cymru driving something, you'd think, well, that really is not how parliamentary democracy should work. It should work for the broad mass of people. Yeah. Now, thankfully, with our system here, we can't get that. You know, we have three and four or five seat constituencies, and it can be maddening, it can be frustrating, and you sometimes look at some of them and say, how the hell did they get elected? But by and large, our TDs represent us. They are us. And, you know, consensus kind of emerges. Sorry, excuse me. Sure. Um, 
that GDPR, you think GDPR wants to be elected in for the next election? Mm -hmm. Like, what, what a level of earthquakes needed then to shake up everything? Isn't this the kind of thing that you see it in? And yeah, uh, I think. Such a as well. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not convinced the Scots are ready to vote for, for independence. And the only way, the, the only earthquake that is feasible in Northern Ireland is a border pole, and that's a good long way off because, you know, it might be another generation or two. So I think it's going to be preserved in some sort of, you know, stable nitrogen environment, like long lived, you know, not long lived fruit or something. Fruit right. and nuts. Yes, ma'am. Right. Could I just ask again? Because we hear so much about it, and yet I still can't get anybody to talk about it. What is the fact? The backstop is, the, is, the, is, is basically the part of the withdrawal agreement that says there won't be a hard border in Ireland. Now, how do you enforce that? Well, that's the question. If you don't want a hard border in Ireland, then there has to be either a, the entire UK has to be in the customs union, in which case why leave Brexit, why, why have Brexit, or you have to have checks between Northern Ireland and the UK, which you know is a genuine need. Of, you know, an, an issue for a country. You know, would we want to see border checks between, you know, Tipperary and, and Limerick? Please don't ask that. Uh, but I mean, this is, you know, I mean, it's a genuine, it's a genuine issue they have to, they have to overcome. But the UK is a multinational coalition. I mean, the laws in Wales are not quite the same as the laws in England. Scotland has an entirely separate legal, educational, political. System. Northern Ireland has a whole different set again. So there is precedent. There, there are precedents for having divergent uh, situations uh, across parts of the UK. It's just that May is so weak that the DUP are able to say, well, hold up, we don't want that, and therefore we're not going to vote for it, and you're depending on us to hook, stay in power. So, you know, she has consistently put the unity of the Tory party above. The, the good of the, the UK people. You know, my wife and I have discussions of this, and you know, she has some admiration for Theresa May. I mean, I do too, in the sense that I think you have to be incredibly stubborn, but I, I really have much less admiration than I have frustration. This crowd here, you're all very quiet in the corner. <laughs> they are. I knew, I knew you'd be the one. And who are you going to get? Well, that's right, who are you going to get? And also, she's out, or the Tories are out. And well, the Tories won't be out. The, Tory, the latest opinion poll, the, the UK is, is cursed by having an incredibly weak government and an even weaker opposition. The Labour Party are tearing themselves apart, both ideologically and, and, and personally. The latest opinion poll gave the Tories 41% and Labour 31%. I mean, they should be 70%. Any opposition what it saw should be able to make hate with this kind of nonsense that's going on. And you get the can't land punch? Yes, sir. Why is there such resistance to a second referendum now that we have new information? No, ask, don't ask me. We have a referendum every second week, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> the UK made such an unmitigated haze of it. They don't do referenda because they don't have a written constitution. And therefore, they had no experience of running a referendum. They don't have a referendum commission. They don't have the ability, they, they don't have a population educated to the nuances of binary choices. And they aren't used to it. So I mean, whatever you might think about repealing the Eighth Amendment, nobody can say that we didn't think about this long and bloody hard for 40 years, three and four times, taking the pulse of the people. Same thing with divorce, same thing with lots of other issues. You know, we have a country where, you know, we, I think we take referenda fairly seriously and people generally think long and hard and decisions are made. And that's part of our political psyche. The, the, the Swiss are very similar. So the UK just doesn't do it like that. It hasn't had to. It, it's, it's always relied on Parliament. And in general, the UK Parliament over the years has been a pretty effective way of governing. I mean, they've done it. You know, they've kept the country going as a going concern for 600 years, so they must be doing something right. But surely at this point, they 
sense. Of course it makes sense, but you know, we're, we've long since left the land of sense, you know. In, in an environment where, you know, Boris Johnson can be seen as a credible leader of a nuclear armed state, you know. Yes. No, no, the ladies first. Binding, is it? so, it's binding on the day. 
do something else. One of the great principles of the UK is that no parliament can bind a subsequent parliament. So they could take a no deal off the table tomorrow and put it back on on Thursday if they wished to. But if, they, if it is a binding vote and they say, we are instructing the government not to have a no deal. The problem is, they might end up with a no deal because there's nothing else available. So it might be legally binding, but impractical. Would they have to bring in another law to stop them going out in mass? The only way they will stop that is if they rescind Article 50 and withdraw it and say, sorry, all that mess, do you know what? I actually love you anyway, I'm not going to leave. But at this stage, you know, other, ba other bags are packed, the stuff is piled up in the lawn, they're arguing about who gets the stereo. You know, it's, it's at that level. Yeah. Doesn't that make it null and void? Oh, I would argue, but, you know. I mean, logically. Again, you were talking about common sense earlier on, and now you're on logic. What sort of insanity is this woman? <laughs> hey, of course it does, but... But, but why isn't anyone saying that? Well, they are, but nobody's listening to the people who are saying that. I mean, there's plenty of UK legal experts and political experts going, this is complete nonsense, this should be just declared. I mean, no, but no, but the government isn't going to do it. The referendum was an advisory referendum. It's not like in Ireland, where if we decide we want to delete Article X, it goes. If we vote for it to go, it's gone. As soon as the president signs that into law, it's gone. If we want to insert something into the Constitution, it's in. You know, yes, there are ways in which people can challenge the vote, but you know, they've never been successful. The UK referendum was merely an advisory. The withdrawal is as a consequence of May and our government invoking the Article 50 agreement. That's what's dragging the UK out. Not the referendum. The referendum was a straw in the wind. And you know, 4852 is pretty close. It wasn't even that, it was closer than that. To go and do something as final as the Article 50 would seem to me to be a real political gamble, even at the time, and it has subsequently shown to be so. So, you're right, but is she not being involved about doing this? Why, why couldn't she just wait? She's a secret, secret I've no idea. I mean, this is a person who has had a bee in their bonnet about immigration for a decade or more. As Home Secretary, you know, it, fundamentally there's a xenophobia about this. Uh, and it's a, it's a two-sided two xenophobia. It goes like this. Uh, one, we don't want all these people coming here taking our jobs. We don't want all these Poles and all these Latvians and all these people coming and taking our jobs. Well, they're not because you weren't doing the jobs, but anyway. But it's quite okay for Paddy, and it's quite okay for Patel. Why? They're not really real independent countries, they're just part of us. That's the thing. That, you know, there's a lot of people in the UK who'd be quite happy. They, they don't see us as really independent. They don't see India or, or Pakistan. It's like, it's kind of funny brown Irish people, really. And so it's a curious double-sided xenophobia. You know, Magda is unabashedly foreign. She has a foreign name. She was never part of the Commonwealth. You know, Piotr is definitely foreign. He's a real foreigner. I mean, you know, we've had, we have 17% of, of the Irish population were born outside the island. <laughs> Our experience of mass immigration has been lots of pale Catholics coming to us. Indeed, that's hard. How will we ever assimilate these people who look and act exactly like us, except they have more of a, less vowels and more consonants? You know, that's it. And that's why in general, you know, nothing, you know, nobody cares. The UK has had mass immigration for a long time. It became politically impossible, and correctly so, to engage in race-based race politics in the 1970s. Go back and look at UK sitcoms in the 1970s. It ain't half hot now. On the buses. Poking fun at paddies and packies. And that went, and quite rightly so. But that pool of xenophobia lies dormant. It's like a virus. It's got to come out somewhere. And it comes out and you've got rags. Filthy, lying rags. 
like the dirty hate mail and the scum. And I say these, and I'll say them to their faces, which are nothing more than the modern equivalent of the Volkisch Beobachter and of the other Nazi ranks, drumming up hatred against their fellow man. Lies, lies, and more lies that you simply could not get away with in a mature political environment. And that drip feed of poison. A man, Boris Johnson, who as the Brussels correspondent of the Telegraph, one of the most influential newspapers, admitted he made up stories out of whole cloth to make the European Union say bad, which were then ran as fact. This is just astonishing. Imagine if Mick Clifford admitted tomorrow. Yeah, all that stuff was right in the sidelines. <laughs> you know, or, or Gavin Jennings, Morning Ireland, and today I would like to announce for the last 10 years I've been lying. Beautiful job in a second. So this is the problem. This is not the new, the rub of it. This is the root canal, political root canal that they need. Do you see if anybody else wants it? So any other questions? Can we make time for two more? Yeah. So one here, then two here, and we're ready. Yeah. Well, like, Yes. Any authority at all? No. And we've got into the problem. No. Charles the first dealt with that. Yes, sir. Well, I, I, I get you. It's just not the last word. What's your other question? Just following on, there is another problem about immigration. Mm -hmm. So why in Europe is it not sorted <coughs> by a number of people per square mile? Because it's crowding that seems to be But there's no crowding. There's no crowding. In England? There isn't any crowding in England. There's crowding in London. Mm -hmm. There's crowding in London. There's no crowding in Scotland, I'm sure, or Wales, or southeast of England, southwest of England. They're not crowded. They have an urbanised landscape, but that's not crowded. The Dutch have a very urbanised landscape, but they also have lots and lots and lots of green areas. The Germans, similarly, here, you know, we kind of scatter ourselves around you know, every single Irish person's dream is a, like what I have, you know, detached house and a half an acre. Uh, which is, of course, environmentally and every other way very bad, but we like that and that's what we do. The UK isn't crowded. The UK is by no means a crowded country. And there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever in any study that immigration has had anything other than a positive effect on pretty much every European country. Whether that immigration comes from boards of, you know, previously middle class Syrians, or comes from Polish plumbers, in the medium term, immigration unanimously raises all boats. But they're far, and that's xenophobia. Just uh, regarding Frank Fair and xenophobia, uh, how yes. do you raise their performance in all of this, and, and also with regard to the more pressure will come on them in the coming mm -hmm. weeks? And uh, there's another one there we mentioned more of COVID, which would be a huge generation. Yeah. Mark Dorf coming back today, and also SCLP and Fianna Fáil, and yeah. there, how deep do you think? Hands up anybody here who remembers Austin Curry being drafted in. Oh. See? We've been done, we've, we've, this isn't the first time that rodeo has been played. Yeah, 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 yeah. way back. I, I think, Veronica, I think the general the Irish political system has played it like. I think they've had a very weak hand, they've played it very skillfully. I think Michal Martin deserves huge credit, um, especially because of the fact that you know, he's not going to get any thanks from the grassroots of Fianna Fáil, nor would he expect it, nor in a sense should he. I mean, he's, he's doing the statesman-like thing, which is putting the country above politics. I think Varadkar and Coveney have done a great double act. I think the real star of this has been Helen McEntee, you know, who has been indefatigable in, in her role as Europe Minister really the gopher behind the scenes, keeping the whole thing linked together. But Coveney and Bradford have, I think, been, especially Coveney, very calm in the face of, you know, sometimes intolerable abuse. They've been very cohesive. They know that, generally speaking, the Parliament is behind them, that people are behind the broad thrust of policy. I mean, we might argue about some of the tactics that we, you know, won't stop us giving them a kicking next time they come up for election because that's the deal. I think most people agree, and the polls seem to suggest most people agree, they've done a pretty good job with what they had. So I think, you know, regardless of what political party you support, we've been looking that we've had a system that has allowed the people at the top 
to do the job that they had to do for the country in these times. Margaret. Oh, I'm about to stop that again. Put your hands up the cover paint, please. You were saying there's a rise in nationalism in, in England. Yeah. But like there's a rise in nationalism now in Hungary and Italy and a lot of these other countries. Yeah. Is that all part of immigration or is it again? It's whipped up it by right wing press. It's whipped up by the resurgence of fascism. Fascism wasn't eradicated by polite words. Fascism was shot in the head in very niche. I'm really passionate about this. Fascism is a disease of the European liberal order. And it is spread by the media. Every time we swallow the lies, a little bit of us dies. You know, fascism was hunted down and hung by its heels in Milan, and it was buried in a shell hole and burned by the Russians. It wasn't reasoned with, it wasn't talked nicely to. It is never a bad time to call fascists what they are, fascism. There's a wonderful, wonderful short article by a great writer called Umberto Eco. And he called it Ur Fascism, the origins of fascism. And he talks about his experience growing up in Italy in the 19, late 1930s and 40s. And if you just go online and Google, you know, like, you know, signs of measles, signs of fascism, there's about 10 things that are definitive characteristics that political scientists will say, you know, yes, you're a fascist. And we see these rising again in Europe. It's no coincidence that as the last people who shot the fascists are dying off, the spiritual, uh, the hell-born descendants of these fascists are back amongst us, walking amongst us. And they're walking the streets of Paris tonight, you can be damn sure. They're walking the streets of every town, every city. The danger is, some of them are in power. And I, I, it's interesting that you, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned Orban. Orban is an interesting guy. He probably isn't a fascist. He's certainly an autocrat if he could get away with it. He's not talking about leaving the European Union. He's got a big beef with with, with Soros because of personal issues. They used to be really good votes, they fell out. You know, this is kind of Devin Collins. If Collins was a billionaire and alive, which he wasn't. <laughs> you know, Poland, the Law and Justice Party, a right wing, nationally oriented. They're not talking about even the European Union. UKIP is a fascist party. I'm happy to say that to any UKIP person that stands in front of me. You're a fascist, I don't want to talk to you. Don't talk to fascists, don't argue with fascists, don't discuss with fascism, you will be infected. I mean, I really think, as a country, we're looking with our decentralized, it's maddening, it's frustrating, but because most people, even in Nazi Germany, weren't fascists. You know, the idea that somebody could kind of gain a fascist party, could gain power in Ireland, first of all, we'd laugh at them, you know, for the most part. Secondly, they wouldn't get elected through the dog killer country. You know, so our decentralized system kind of immunizes us against that. Countries like the UK, where you have an extreme concentration of wealth, you have an extreme concentration of power through the first past the post system, and where you have what Hitler called the Lusen press, the lying press. I mean, you know, there's nothing. Lies. Complete lies. May as well read the Beano. You get more in out of the Beano, you know, at least before the bear would tell you to go out and throw a bottle at something. So Nationalism is on the rise. It's helped by dark money. It's helped by powerful interests who want to tear the whole thing down and engage in a bit of disaster capitalism. But it doesn't have to win. It'll only win if we get it. Right.
The other thing I'd like to ask that while I have you all here, captive audience, could I just ask you to put another date in your diary, please? Our next eating event in Nina Library will be on Thursday, the 4th of April. We're very lucky we will have a speakers on uh, the EU and me. What has the EU ever done for me? Uh, Noel Whelan and Stephen Kinsella. Very, and actually I have to thank you, Brian, for recommending Stephen Kinsella. Yeah. You gave me his name. Uh, so Noel Whelan and Stephen Kinsella. Just in the run up to the European elections are coming up, as you know, at the end of May. Uh, so that talk is on Thursday, the 4th of April, in Nina Library, for the next in our series of talks, the uh, Nina series of talks. May I thank you once more again for coming out tonight. Okay. May I also thank Brian. Uh, when we first uh, approached Brian as a speaker last year uh, for Brexit, uh, last year, not only did he jump at the chat and chance and wouldn't hear of any payment, jump at the chance of coming down and down. He says, I'll come back anytime you want. And we said, yes, we did. <laughs> we ran him straight away. The talk and dance yeah, went last year. <laughs> the talk and dance went last year. We said, we didn't even wait. We said, we'll get you out back again next year. And we knew we wanted to bring him to a different centre, to a wider audience, to a more central place, which is why we picked the source here in Paris. And once again, my thank you to the staff at the source uh, for that. I won't delay you any longer, just to say goodnight. Thank you.